Welcome back or welcome to the On Coaching Podcast with Magnus and Marcus. I am Steve Magnus, the Deputy Director of High Performance West, joined by John Marcus, the Director of High Performance West. John, another beautiful day, a cold one in Houston, but another great day to talk running. Well, Portland is balmy and 55, so we are obviously out there shirtless, trying to get as much vitamin D as possible because that sun's going away real quick but no matter what the weather no matter the location we're here to give the people what they want that's right and uh you know it's well you guys are balmy and sunny we're um freaking out over the freezing cold and the city is shut down because it's 28 degrees so that's what happens when you live in houston but you know what happens when it's cold and everything's canceled you write awesome articles for highperformancewest.com that's our sponsor it's ourselves. We sponsor ourselves famously since 1983, or at least since I was born in 1983. So, uh, no, it's awesome. We just got done with the first on coaching mini workshop, a mini because it was a test in Seattle recently with um, a good friend and colleague, Danny Mackey, the Brooks Beast. Uh, a lot of great feedback. Uh, it was just an awesome time for coaches, you know, to come together either online through our global community or in person and then just spend some time coach to coach. Um, so we're going to do it again, and we're going to do it frequently. Ideally, you know, six bigger ones will come throughout the year, sprinkled in, you know, hopefully every two months, give or take schedules and coaching. Because the difficulty that Steve and I run into is we are not keyboard coaches. We are skin in the game, at track meets, you know, holding ourselves and our athletes to account. So that's always number one. But this passion project of you know, sharing and caring is a close number two. And then two, we're going to offer memberships here real quickly, a way to join the community a little bit more officially through different gradients. So we have, you know, the scholar program, um, being HBW scholar, which is essentially for the coach to, um, you know, get some more in-depth content or exchange, um, either right there in your inbox or through other uh, vehicles or directly from Steve and I. So this sp spawned from a bunch of coaches asking us just different questions like, hey, what are you reading? What's your you know reading list here and there? Or what, what books do you recommend for this? Or how do you think about this? Or I have a question about this. And amazing questions. And it's you know been a privilege to uh, be asked them and also provide a response. But we wanted to say, well, how can we streamline a little bit more and give the people what they want, which is a little bit further in-depth um, analysis and thought and um, uh, conversation and dialogue about it versus just Steve and I getting here on the pod and, you know, shouting as loud as we can and hopefully, you know, having you guys listen and take something away. And yeah. then, two, we also have the athlete membership, which is actually coaching athletes, coaching them up. You know, uh, Steve and I have a, a bandwidth where we can actually provide some more athlete services. Not a whole lot of athletes adding through, but a diff different gradients. And then finally, the combo, the polymath, right? Scholar meets athlete. Best of both words. You're a coach of a team. You're maybe a younger coach, older coach, but you're also still a competitor. You're getting out there and you're competing yourself. Steve and I both lived that. It's a tough balance. And you need to be fed and nourished you know, through both um, – lenses to be able to make it work and you can make it work we did make it work for a long time um, and we just want to provide that support because i think it's important to be able to have that empathy and compassion for what you're you know asking athletes under your charge to do because you're out there doing workouts busting your butt too day in and day out you, you know my favorite part of this before we get into the podcast is that i think it allows us to give the in-depth like knowledge and details that I would send in an email to one of my post collegiate professional athletes on, you know, uh, marathon fueling or like, Hey, what's the warm up procedure look like? What is it? What's the best things to do? Um, what are the best recovery methods? Like, what does that all look like? And really go in into detail and depth on like the nitty gritty on what actually matters in this platform that we're trying to create allows us to give those same content details, you know, knowledge gained from uh, decades of coaching now uh, to you guys. So hopefully you'll enjoy it, but check it out. Um, as always, the goal is just to give you guys better information 
um, get those conversations going and make us all better coaches and athletes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's fun. And like I, I wake up every day passionate and excited to go do the craft of coaching and then work on this to help build something that hopefully down the road is going to, you know, just make coaches better coaches. And, you know, selfishly, the profit I get from this is the exchange and learning and connecting with new people like that is, man, what I'm looking forward to most and what I took away biggest from our um, mini workshop here in Seattle recently was just meeting new coaches and exchanging ideas. And that's where real education and conversation and growth happens is in those little moments. So look out for it. January 25th, it's online. You can download, click it, buy it, sign up, spread it, judge it, enjoy it, whatever you want. So that's coming at you hot. (laughs) So (laughs) um <laughs> uh, on that topic what, what are we talking about today this this week competing winning what's the difference between being in the club and actually coming away with the victory right yes hashtag winning we're all about winning today <laughs> that's right the w hashtag winning um we're just gonna win so much you're gonna be sick of it um yes. just kidding so yeah you know I was having a conversation with one of my athletes after the uh, recent Houston half, half marathon, Ryan Donor, and we were talking about him executing the race, and he did a great job, PR'd by a minute and a half in the, the half marathon to run 60, mm-hmm. 62.42. And after the race, we were excited, and he was you know amped up, and he's like, all right, like what next, what next? And we sat there and had a conversation of saying, like, okay, like now you're getting near the club right mm. you get you're getting competitive you're in a spot you know sub 63 um a good spot where you can start competing at some of these higher levels and start looking at placing high and wins and smaller meets and stuff like that um and the emphasis shifts right and mm. we, we were talking about how the goal of this one was just to get in the club right put yourself in there with other people competing at this national level and now the emphasis shifts from being in the club to okay, n- now we got to do something, right? Mm. And what are we gonna do, and how are we gonna train you differently to make it from being in that <laughs> in one of those top packs to being able to move, being able to compete at the I- end, being able to battle for a spot, um, <laughs> either either to place really highly or even for the win in certain races. It, there's a different calculus, I think, between the athlete who crests the finish line first and the athlete who is in the race but never really steps up to bat and swings. And what I mean by that is you have to, in my opinion, adopt a winner's posture. I'm preparing to win. How am I going to win this? That's the question that you know the seasoned athlete, the athlete who's ready, the athlete who's stepping into the club as, say, donor is here – needs to color all their training. How am I going to win this race coming up? How am I going to win this championship six months from now? How am I going to win this, you know, um, super target, as I call it, race Mm -hmm. two years from now, right? How am I going to do that? What is that going to look like? Not, I hope I can win. Maybe I can win. If I get fit enough, yeah, then okay. And I think we do a disservice a lot with um, being so wedded to – the stopwatch or the heart rate or these um, data inputs that do matter that do help you know guide us but it takes away from the fact that competition championship meets is just about beating the other people on the line that is it does not matter if you run a pr or you jog for the first three quarters and then sprint all out it's just how to get to the finish line first game and that you know, unfortunately, because we've become so ingrained in uh, Western distance coaching with, you know, metabolism, developing this aerobic foundation and all these, you know, very key and important scientific ingredients. But we've gone away from that emotional um, readiness, that emotional, uh, you know, enthusiasm for saying, I'm going to get in this race, I'm going to go win. And you see it time and time again. Uh, people who become, uh, you know, herald champions and that we remember and we put on pedestals, they just know how to win no matter the race, fast, slow, you know, humid, very cold, raining, 
you know, surges, just, it doesn't matter. And that I think ultimately is what competition is about. It's not about saying, Hey, I scored this many points per game in the NBA or my, you know, um, batting average is this in like baseball or, you know, this is my PR. I'm a, you know, four flat miler guy. Like I want to know, you know, when you step onto the line, what should I expect? And that's really to me what a winner is about. When I step on the line, what should we expect from you? Oh, you, what you should expect from someone is who's a winner is to figure out a way to make it happen regardless of, you know, who's in the race. What you can expect from an also ran kind of a wannabe is to be there the first half of the race. And then when it gets hard, it gets difficult. It gets, you know, Oh, it's uncertain. I don't know if the outcome's uncertain in my favor for them to fade away. Yeah. And I think we have an opportunity to move athletes in practice to ready themselves to take an opportunity to swing big and swing for the fences. Yeah, you know, what I tend to see is those who are just trying to get in that club or in that race are the ones who I would, you know, compare to playing prevent defense in football, right? So where where they're in the game, they're trying to, but they're playing they're playing a little bit not to lose, right? They're playing mm-hmm. playing just enough to, like, be part of the story but not be the main actors and when you're trying to progress to the next level like you have to take an active component into the race and you're no longer just being that passive um you know passive background actor who's part of it but not really someone anyone is worried about and you can see this when you watch um ncaa track races especially indoors right you, mm-hmm. you can very readily tell in like a 3K or 5K who the players are in the first couple laps, right? Because they're the <coughs> they're the people <clears throat> who are putting themselves in a position to do something and then making the moves to put themselves where they, they have a shot to win or place really highly, right? And then you have the other people in that who are almost just like the fillers who are just – Hey, like I'm going to go for a ride and if people fall apart a little bit, like I'll knock off one or two of you. Um, or they're also the people who, you know, Hey, I have no shot in this or little shot. So I'm going to be the person leading when I, or trying to like drag someone out when there's no hope of doing that. Right. Um, so I think that active component in it, like, taking charge and having some sort of sense of control over what you're doing is step one to deciding like hey am i gonna am i gonna compete for the win on this versus having some playing some passive role yeah and that's what sports about it's a sports about teaching initiative taking ownership being an impresario right if you're just encouraging an athlete to run an evenly you know pace race all the time and that the win quote unquote is just running faster than you did before you got to question yourself are you actually being a developmental coach or are you being a compliance coach because to me the definition of a compliance coach is someone who writes a prescription someone who says do this work at this you know, grade of effort, this, this level of competency. And once you do it, I will give you, a, you know, some type of validation about how well you did it in line with my expectation. So run the, the docket says run 80 miles a week. You run 80 miles a week. You pass a, the docket says run 12 times 470 with 200 meters recovery in two minutes. You do it right on the nose. You pass a, but as a developmental coach, <clears throat> you are always trying to create a winning mindset. You always try to create a posture of initiative. You have to prove it on the starting line. It does not matter how fit you get. No one's going to give you a victory. And so if the athlete's not ready to step to the line to prove their merit, to prove their worth, to prove their you know, desire, and, make, and they make that decision on their own um, you know, to get after it and take a swing, well, you're guaranteed to lose if you don't. I mean, even if you're in the race and you never put yourself in a winning position, you're guaranteed to lose. And what do I call a winning position? It's always with an eye on the podium. So, you know, in the first half of the race of any race, you can be kind of just in the mix of it because any race, the first half, typically everyone can participate. But 
when it goes gets beyond halfway, so 400 meters to go in the eight, you know, 800 meters to go in the mile, et cetera, all the way up the food chain, you got to be in the podium position. So that's top five at least, but with a clear eye on spots one, two, three, if you're not already occupying it. Because what I've noticed from years and years and years and years of watching championship racing and just general racing is people who are not in that podium position, the majority of time, not all, but the majority of the time do not, are not even in the conversation to, you know, uh, vie for the, the apps, the absolute outright win at the end of the race. Now, you do have those come from behind ones and this and that, but that's more atypical than it is commonplace. Um, so well, you have, oh, go ahead, Steve. Well, well I was going to say, I, th- I think if you look at the 800, for instance, like Nick Simmons, who's a come from behind, right? But mm-hmm. but he knows through years that w- what is his position to go for the win or go for the like the medal, right? He, he Him at 400 meters being where he is, is the position he knows he needs to be to go for the win right so you know a lot of times we sit here and we think like oh you got to be in position for you know got to be in first or second or third and that's not that is most of the time the case but sometimes it's not and it's knowing who you are and knowing okay like if i'm executing for this win across this whole race like a nick simmons like where do i need to be to set myself up best to compete and sometimes that's may, maybe not out front, but it's always with eye eye to that spot. Like Nick Simmons in his best races, even if he's off the back a little bit, you know his target. He knows where his target is, right? He's not worried about like, oh, I got to hang on to the back of number seven in this race, right? He's mm-hmm. thinking like, okay. How do I move to put myself where I'm coming off the corner, off the last hundred, where I'm charging, trying to do something? And I think that's a very subtle uh, difference of, you know, someone who puts himself in a spot to win, who doesn't maybe necessarily look like it in the first 200. Yeah, and I would argue Nick Simmons' um, prototype or archetype racing strategy when he is at his peak is uncommon. You know, I would say... Look at David Rudisha, look at Joaquin Cruz, look at Johnny Gray. Those people at that level, they demonstrate a high degree of proficiency, but also they had skin in the game. They had they staked their claim. They said, yep, I'm here at the starting line to give it a swing and try to win. Where, why are you? Why are you here? And it, it's a... You know, it's like checking in basketball. It's like you got a gut check to figure out why you're at that starting line. And I just see no reason to go and, you know, do all the preparation, go through all the rounds and get the qualifying marks, et cetera, to go to a national championship and then be like, hey, I made the meet. Look at me. I made the meet. That is simply the price of admission. That's all that is. You know, it's like buying a movie ticket. You're in the theater. Good job. But now what you're going to do with it? And I think that's the part people don't think through it. They think making the championship is a very difficult endeavor. And then when they get there, the common, oh, I didn't even think I was going to make it here and then freak out mode. And I've had that happen to me multiple times as a coach where I'm like, oh, I didn't even think I didn't, I didn't have the maturity or experience to think that this person was, who was prepared very diligently for a year, two years, whatever, would then waste their moment, waste their opportunity by creating such anxiety about being on stage with the best of their um, competition, whether it's high school, college, you know, or professional that it caught me off guard many times. But now I prepare for it because, again, why do all the work physically, make all this sacrifice, if then you get to that target race, that pinnacle race, and you're your biggest sabotager, right? And it just befuddled me. So, Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I, th- I think if, if we kind of break this down now, like you look at it and what we're talking about a lot is like the mental side. Right. Mm -hmm. Like making that mindset decision or that mindset shift from like being a uh, role player to being someone who's trying to, you know, do something. Right. And that that comes in a couple aspects besides just the mental side of it. And one we've kind of touched on briefly is that tactics standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's like learning how to execute tactics that not just put you there. Right. But put you in a place to do something. 
And I think that's incredibly different. And if you look at um, if you look at most of our racing schedule, the emphasis isn't isn't on tactically putting yourself in to do something. The emphasis is on tactically putting yourself on a pack or on a certain pace and then just hang on. Right. right. Yeah. And like there's a completely different tactical awareness that needs to be developed. And the last part of this, and maybe we'll dis- dissect all of it a little bit, is the physical p- capacity to do so, right? Mm-hmm. The, the workouts change a little bit, or the workout emphasis shifts a little bit when you start thinking about, okay, like, no, we're no longer trying to hit a standard. Now we're trying to, hey, have the skill set needed to compete, right? Mm-hmm. The skill set needed to match surges, drop the pace, change the gears, go through all of that against competitors who who might be better than us, right? Right, and I was, you know, uh, happy to dissect it. Let's start at, you know, where I like to start, the psychological, emotional side. And I was telling uh, Danny Mackey this past weekend after we were both just debriefing from our athletes' performances at the UW Preview just as our, you know, indoor opener, I go, man, I really think at this stage in the game, we're just teaching decision making because that's really what you want to do is empower the athlete to make the better decision, not the right. I, I get, I, I just strangle that quickly because when you create that dichotomy, right, wrong, good, bad, then you create this hesitation, but just make the better decision. And the better decision is the decision that puts you in a competitive advantage. The better decision is where you're initiating, where you're stepping up, where you're saying, I'm going to go get this or make a bid to get this rather than hope everyone in front of me falls down magically because they haven't been training as well as I have and I just have superior fitness and they're just going to like melt away, which is not going to be the case. So the decision has to be on the starting line. I, I remind people the thought that you have in your mind before the gun goes off needs to be a continuous strain of thought immediately after the gun goes off. The thought I encourage people to have is like, let's go. Let's get this. I'm so excited. That gun, fire it right now. Can you start to hurry this up? Because I got things to do on the track, right? And I, I think excitement for me is where I found a lot of athletes resonate with and a positive excitement to say, now I'm making a decision to keep chasing my dream, to keep being in a winning position. And two, is a quick caveat here and aside. Winning is not just crossing the finish line first. It's actually, did you do something beyond your comfort zone, right? I, you know, I posted a tweet, something to the effect recently, as I was reflecting, um, coming back from this, this track meet, it's before the important work, we rarely ever feel good. It doesn't happen. Oh, I feel fresh. I feel snappy. No, you automatically feel the, (laughs) but after that work is done, after that important work has been executed, you feel great. You PR'd, you beat people you weren't supposed to beat, you won the race. And that to me is what winning's all about is, you know, proving people wrong or proving people or putting people on notice saying, they picked me to be, you know, 10th and I mustered everything I had and I got fifth or fourth. That is a, a win. Not what ends up happening is sometimes you get what I call, you know, um, you know, the JV, um, uh, Constellation Prize, which is like, oh, and by the way, I PR'd, but I didn't really go for it. But I didn't really make an effort to extend so far out my comfort zone. I didn't really do this. And the time the J- the PR is what I call JV is when it's just a consolation for, well, you're fit and you ran the fastest you ever ran. Good job, you know. Get him next time, Tiger. And I think this boils down to w- performance, because this podcast and what High Performance West is about, and what Steve and I are about is the sport of distance running where competition and the result does matter. Now we're process oriented to get there, but we need to keep accountability across all channels, coach, athlete, et cetera, that the sport teaches us a lot. The participation model doesn't really teach, it's just passive showing up, doing the activity, but the sport requires preparation, perseverance, disappointment, expectation, you know, and resiliency amongst the other host of important traits that are learned through participation in the sport. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a good point, especially on defining winning, because I think, you know, what I always tell my college athletes is 
in the race you need to see where you're gonna where you want to be right and, and you got to be able to be in inside of where you're going to be halfway through and and that's like defining winning as accomplishing something that <laughs> and competing in a way that you haven't before right it's not necessarily um you know necessarily placing first in the race um so i think that's important you know i think about another thing i was dissecting last year's world champs a little bit in the 10k for um iaaf who did some biomechanics research on it right and what's interesting is they had the women's and men's 10k and they had all this biomechanics data and normally what you see in the research in and well-trained runners quote unquote in research land like when fatigue starts hitting maybe halfway through 10k you start seeing like subtle mechanical changes right um yep but in this and at worlds in the 10k especially in the men's despite being on low low 27 minute pace so good <laughs> good fast pace yeah there, there were no mechanical change signs of fatigue among the first like five or six runners all the way up until I think like lap 25. Right. Huh. Yeah. So like no signs, which is kind of mind blowing in a way, but like what that emphasized to me is that these guys are in a position to race, right? You're not gonna, at, at the highest level, you're not going to take like the damage out that you can uh, at a, uh, a high school level, for instance. Um, these guys are setting themselves up so that, hey, when it comes down to race over the last 400, 800K, whenever that move comes, like we've got to have the capacity to do so. And I think if you go to the next point of winning, which is like the training physical standpoint of it is... Like, you got to make sure that you're fit enough to get there, number one, right? You got to be in the club. You got to be at, you know, 9K without showing mechanical signs of uh, fatigue. And then you have to possess the skill set, which can be trained to be able to execute whatever it is you need to do to um, go with surges, compete, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think that skill set is entirely different from the the time trial skill set right so mm -hmm. a lot of times we look at efficiency and all that stuff and fatigue but we look at it on, on a steady state standpoint but the the capacity to change gears in a moment the capacity to change gears without a huge metabolic uh, cost increase is a skill and it's a skill that we can teach but very rarely do so yeah, and you have to program that teaching in practice. I'll give a, a quick recent example, right? You know, Eleanor Fulton, one of the um, female modelers I coach, she ran a 1K, 3K double. PR, you know, got second in the 1K. You know, it was kind of a weird race. Came back four hours later, PR'd in the 3K. Ran 9.14, 26-second PR. Next day, she was feeling good, and on her own accord, she just kind of hammered her long run a little bit wasn't like I said anything. I was just, she's on her own. She's like, I felt good. So I just went and said, yeah, that's fine. You know, she jogged really easy yesterday. Um, today's Tuesday. We're recording this on Monday. Jogged easy. And then today she had, you know, her toughest workout on paper ever. And what that was, was that on paper, it was a hard mile, you know, or I guess a, a 5k mile, two by 800 at mile pace, you know, 3K mile, two by 800 at um, goal mile pace, and then just see what you got last mile. It's like six miles. It was like intense. She was like, man, I'm sweating it, you know, and all along I was like, she's not doing all that. But I needed to put her in a position of being like, whoa, this is going to be big because to help her be ready to compete at the highest level – she needs to have this pressure and this expectation that she can do difficult things and that she's going to show up to the track to do it. Now, as the, the session went along, you know, it was a lot more psychology and dialogue and discussion going on through the session than hit the pace, hit the pace, hit the pace. And so, it, you know, we got to the second mile and I was like, look, here's what I'm looking for. 
the last 600, you just need to open up and just drill it. She goes, well, what about the two eights in the mock? Don't worry about it. You, you, you got to stay in the race. And to stay in the race, sometimes you have to just drill it from 600 out. <laughs> like, you know, whether – because the calculus is – I need to have enough energy in reserve to kick the last 200 and have enough to kick. No, 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 no. You need to stay in the race no matter what. And then we get finally to, you know, and she ran, you know, brilliantly and dropped the 70 last um, 400 on that mile. I was like, oh, great. That is what I wanted to see the whole workout, you know, and then her privilege was to do only one 800, scrap the rest. So scrap the other eight in the last mile because we just didn't need to do it. But the game was, now give me your best date possible. Just your best. No watch. Take it off. You need to go and just keep going and keep going. You're the energizer as a bunny. Everything you have, pour yourself into this. Because if you're looking at the watch for direction in a race, you've already lost. But if you're dealing and struggling with the discomfort and fatigue, if you're dealing with all the chatter that is useless, you can decide to turn that off. You can decide to focus in on how do I, you know, get one foot in front of the other and maintain the integrity of my position that I've come all this way to do. You know, when she ran, you know, lights out for the day. She doesn't like, you know, really sharing details of her workouts. That's why I'm a little tongue in cheek here. But what I can tell you is she ran her 800 at a pace faster than her 1K. She ran 244 for a 1K on Saturday fresh. Right? And this is at the end of what I call a medium dig cycle, race, long run, and then tough workout. It's impressive, but it means nothing if it can't transfer to actually then being in the moment and at that precipice on race day when it's time to make that decision and go and not blink. Most <laughs> athletes blink, Well, I, and that's the thing we're trying to teach, beat out of them. <laughs> I, I think the key, key phrase you said is in the moment. Right. Yes. Because what often happens is we get into this future direction, right? This future looking. And that's what causes us to hesitate. Because what happens is if we're in the middle of the mile race, we get to uh, 800 meters and... Um, you look at the clock and you say, oh, can oh, I keep this pace yeah. up for another two laps? And then all of a sudden that calculus takes you out of the moment. It kills your race. Yeah, exactly. And you're at, you're out of it. But if you're in the moment and you can just instantly have that intuitive reaction where it's like up oh, gotta go then there's no decision making there right it's very mm -hmm. much ingrained and and you make it you know i was uh i had a couple freshmen who run their first indoor um indoor race ever right at our home meet flat 200 meter track and both came to me afterwards and they were like man i lit a gap form of maybe mm -hmm. just like one and a half meters, right? So not even a, a gap that a, a full person could fit in. And they're like, I let a gap form, and I'm used to being okay with that, you know, out uh, out on the outdoor track. But as soon as it was done, like, I couldn't get back in the race. And I was like, there's your decision there. Like, mm. you weren't focused enough to keep on that, keep on the pack, to keep things tight. So you let the race get away, <laughs> away from you from a momentary decision there. But if you right. were in every moment and focused on what you were doing, you wouldn't have let that little tiny gap form because all it was was a momentary lapse of concentration because you weren't you weren't fatigued enough where one and a half meters is going to make a difference in terms of slowing down, right? It was just a concentration thing. And I think that's where you see athletes <laughs> when they learn in... Um, get to where they are able to compete for wins and compete at that level it's it's that their attention is always there their decision making is you know direct instantaneous etc cetera, etc cetera. and they're able to move when they need to move and they're right. not having these these hesitations and i think that is from a psychological standpoint one of the things that has to be ingrained because the longer you have hesitations the longer you have doubts the longer you're future orientated and not concentrating on what I need to do right here, right now, um, the more those gaps form, the more hesitation comes in and the worse position you're going to be in when the, when it's time to actually go. 
Yeah, it's just a cascade of negative impacting effects. And hesitation to me is really just confusion. If I can't make the better decision, it's because I'm not clear, concise, and precise with what I want to do here. And that's, you know, going back to, that's really what you're teaching with this type of coaching for winning is to develop a winner because they can be developed. You know, a lot of people say, oh, they just know how to win. I don't buy that for a second. So to develop that, you have to regularly, not all the time, but regularly. By that, I mean once every, you know, three weeks and whether that's in practice, not in, not come race day, but in practice, put the athletes between a rock and a hard place. And that session I, you know, shared with Eleanor, that was, that was exactly it. It was like, great. Now you're tired, you're fatigued. And then my word to her was, you need to prove it to yourself in this moment that you can do this. And you just, the only way to prove it is by going and doing it. That is it. This is the most important work and it's done alone. And we'll see. I don't know the outcome, nor do you. Give it a shot. And when you frame it like that, it becomes very clear that they either they accept the challenge or they, you know, as I say, I call it ring the bell. And that is something I use a lot in Navy SEAL training, right? There's the famous Hell Week where they keep you up, you know, and you, Steve, you and Brad would hate this from peak performance. They keep you up for a week with like no sleep. So <laughs> <laughs> they're purposely trying to corrode you, deteriorate you make you want to quit because they're trying to weed, weed out the weak will, right? And what they do is they parade around a bell. And at any given time, you can ring the bell. And then you can get a cup of coffee, you can take a shower, you can go to sleep, you can have a shave. I mean, and they make the Navy SEALs do all this crazy stuff, tread water at night for three hours, march up and down without bathroom breaks, having to defecate on themselves, like you name it, right? And it's just to test their grit and determination. Do you want this? Can we count on you? Can you deliver? And I remind athletes, anytime you can ring the bell, this is on. This is at will. You don't have to do this. You can ring the bell. You know, and I just, you know, let them know. It's, you can just stop and raise your hand. That's just what I call ringing the bell. You can be in the middle of the rep. And if you can't handle it, that's fine. I, I'm not going to hate you. I'm not going to get mad at you and yell. Stop and raise your hand. And no one has ever stopped and raised their hand <laughs> when well, I present that option. You know, and I think this is a part of it, is it's forming habits as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. your, uh, We've said this a million times. You and Danny said it. At this point, you're coaching decision-making. What you're trying to do is ingrain good decisions where it's not even thought. It's not done even reach conscious uh, attention, right? <laughs> it's not, um, you know, there's not an option to stop, right? So a couple weeks ago right. with my, uh, or maybe two weeks ago with my, my college kids, we sat there and we stared at e each other in the eyes. Oh, yes, the great seven-minute stare down. Yeah. And and afterwards, I said like, "Hey, no, no one felt really unco uncomfortable enough where they just stopped and walked out of the room." I was like, "Why? Why do you guys do that?" And they gave me all sorts of different reasons. I said, "Okay, like it didn't even cross into your mind that you could get up and walk out the door. You could have, right? They could they could have easily done that. Like we were having this was a voluntary meeting, right? It wasn't anything, no grades, nothing like that. Could have got up and walked out the door." But they didn't because they didn't think that that option was available. They didn't let it enter their mind. And when we're racing and we're competing, what happens sometimes is we let bad options enter our mind and become possibilities. But the more that we ingrain that that option doesn't exist or that that option is it's maybe there, but I'm never going to take it, the more likely when we're in the thick of things that we're just going to automatically default to the only option we have, which is press on, keep pushing, compete until we can't compete, and execute the race that we're supposed to do. So it's so much of, of this running thing is this decision-making thing. And it starts with, as you said, in practice, <laughs> is, mm -hmm. is, re is running reps is a decision-making process, right? When am I going to speed up? When am I going to slow how hard am I going to push this last rep? Am I going to go with these with my teammates who are maybe feeling great when I don't want to? It's like, what what decisions are you asking? And I think 
a lot of times where we fail at this getting athletes ready to win, which is the subject of this podcast, um, we fail because we don't and we don't give them the power to decide, right? Yes. And when mm-hmm. they don't have the power to decide, then they're relying on us to make that decision, which we can as coaches in practice. But when it comes to racing, we can't make that decision and they have the power to decide. And then they've never been in a point where it is all on them to decide what to do. Right. The worst race plan, in my opinion, is a pace plan. When you say this is a race against the clock, the game we're playing is against the clock. You're going to run a mile race and you need to run 75s exactly every lap. You have now abdicated their attention to being solely on this artifice called time and not engaging with the other competitors in the race. Yes, sometimes you have a kid who is in a varsity race and you have to create a game that they can quote unquote win at if the the field's so far ahead of them or if they're so far ahead of the rest of the field, it's a dual meet or something. That's not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about is if you're going into a race with other competitors of like ability and you're telling them, don't worry about the people you're racing, worry about the, the, the watch, worry about the clock, that's a bad decision, in my opinion, as a coach, because you're now saying that that's the thing that matters most. You know, my preferred posture is to advise people to say, hey, okay, you see Johnny and Billy from rival high school, rival college, you're about similar level of competency they're your what I call immediate target competitors, because in my world you have immediate target competitors, um, you know, and then you have uh, target competitors, and then you have super target competitors. Um, uh, I'll get into that maybe later in our podcast or blog post. But they need to be held to account that these are the people in your conference or in your region that you need to like, you know, game up and race because you need to demonstrate that you have, you know competent or more um competitiveness than them because they're of similar ability right and you can pick you know the same class or whatever however you want to structure that but it's actually remembering that to win at racing is to prepare to beat specific people not the history not the time it's who's in you know championship meets not about Everyone's going to time trial here in the best time of the day, so mail them in, and then we'll decide who the winner is. It's We're all going to get together, no matter the conditions, right? I mean, how many Midwest championships are like in thunderstorms and high humidity? They, you still run the race, right? Who's the best on the day? And as a coach, that game plan, if it is, entails accountability to the watch, uh, you really got to reassess, in my opinion, because you have to ask what you're, really, what you're teaching because you want to be able to put them in that position to be in the moment, not worrying about, do I need to double check what the speed limit is right now? No, I'm just grooving and I'm in the moment and man, there's this car and I want to pass them and I'm on the freeway and I'm going, I don't know how fast I'm going, oh, I'm going 70 miles an hour, I'm going 100 miles an hour, it doesn't matter, right? What matters is that leapfrog game, that getting to the finish line first game and that's a specific way to check yourself as a coach is are you advising them to beat people or are you advising them to, you know, from a compliance activity, to meet this set agenda that you've created, you know, in relation to the watch. Well, you know, that, that analogy with driving is a great one. I use that a lot in the sense of, you know, remember when you first started driving and you were paranoid about like speed limits and like double checking like your speedometer to see how fast you were going on on all these different things, right? And it, it would take you out of the moment. And now... <laughs> As you said, like I can go drive down the road and never check how fast I'm going and feel pretty dang comfortable that I'm within a decent realm of, of, you know, the speed limit or what I'm thinking. Because you have this sense of how fast it is when you press on your car gas pedal, right? Right. (laughs) And I think that's very similar in the, in the racing terms is that like you have to get to a point where the best feedback you have is like the internal one of knowing what you're doing and allow you to execute the skill that you've trained, worked on for months and years, which is <laughs> knowing how far to push that gas pedal down to run what you're trying to run versus constantly giving that control over to something like a watch, right? Or even to something like, you know, a coach's instructions on the side or whatever it is, or 
you know, giving that control even to another competitor if the case is like, oh, just follow this guy, right? So Mm -hmm. (laughs) to me, when we look at winning, it all comes down to, and we talked about at the beginning, is is control. Are you an active or you're a passive participant in the race? Mm Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the wisdom, like say, I learned from Jerry Schumacher and his mentorship was national championship meets, everything's on the line, contracts, making world teams, you name it, you know, his reputation as a coach, you know, with this precocious talent that he's under his wing, he sits far up high in the stands and doesn't say a word because his work, his job has been done. The job of a coach is to prepare athlete for the competitive moment. The athlete's job is to deliver their best effort in that competitive moment. The job of the coach is not to yell endless encouragement at that championship meet and directions and this and that and for the athlete to look over and say, is it okay? Can you, have you given me permission to go now? No, I, I, I don't prescribe to that. That's not, you know, for me, it's not my brand of coaching. So I encourage you to, you know, it takes a lot of maturity. It takes a lot of trust and faith in your training plan, in the athlete's capacity, in the teaching you've infused them with before they step to the line to say, hey, look, you can do it without me. You can do it on your own. I remind people, both national championships I quote unquote coached with Tara Welling, you know, winning the, the half marathon road race title for the U.S. and then also the 15K. I was asleep. I was in home in Portland. <laughs> she was on the East Coast, and I woke up to a bunch of texts saying, "Congrats!" You know, we had talked, we had done all, all our prep. I didn't need to check in or say anything to air race. She just went out and did what she she wanted to do. And you know, th- again, the, that manifestation of for myself seeing the wisdom of Jerry's you know um, approach and action cemented to me like. I don't need to be there if I've done my job now. You know, and I think when I look at it is like the yelling and stuff during a race is for me, not them. Yes. Right. (laughs) When, when we're yelling as a coaches, it's to give us something to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily to make them, you know, do any better or, or have any impact on them because the likelihood is it won't. And if it does, then we need to rethink like what we're teaching our athletes to do. It's just to ease our own self. And similarly, like all, almost all the great professional, you know, races that any of my athletes have had, like I've been nowhere near them. I mean, I wasn't at Natasha's uh, half marathon champs. I wasn't at her 1508 5, 5K. You were there, right? Yeah, I was there. I'll take credit for both yeah. those as proxy coach. Thank you. Th- there no. you go. <laughs> take, take credit for that. And, and, you know, I'll put and, those are on my resume. All right. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But like, and that's the case, like you, you gotta, you know, you gotta do it right. They, they gotta be able to do their own thing. And on the college side, it's very similar. You know, I think a lot of times, like we, we try and baby these kids and I always tell them on race day, like, Hey, <coughs> your warm up, all that stuff, like, just get it done. Like, you know what to do, get it done. You know, I'll be there maybe sometimes like before you race at a a track meet, but I could be somewhere else attending to something else. But like, it doesn't matter. You just got to go through and get it done and know what you're supposed to do. And as long as like we've done our job and practice and leading up to it, um, that should be the case. And I think far too often we hamper our long term development of these athletes by by babying them. You know, yeah, and and we need to teach them to get out of that complacency because yes. that's what that babying and handholding creates is a certain degree of complacency. I'll wait for a coach to tell me what to do in the race. Right, exactly, and and you know, so to give you an example from today, so it's twenty eight degrees out, right, and um, that meant schools canceled in Houston because that's what we do when it gets a little bit cold. If you're listening in Minnesota, I know that means yeah. everyone's out in t-shirts and shorts, but <laughs> so. You know, it's but different, Houston, you know. Texas, different story, different story. <laughs> but so schools canceled, right? And the athletic department canceled all activities. So what does that mean? Like, I can't be there. So I, I, I tech, you know, by rule can't be there. Okay. So my athletes who had workout scheduled and I send out their weekly schedule so that they knew what they were supposed to do today. And I was like, well, you know, do the best you can with what you got. 
So they go over, you know, to our indoor track, which is conveniently open. And they, as a team, you know, they're sending me all these uh, updates after and said, hey, I went to work out and I got it done. Hey, I got this done. And that was like on their own accord. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that speaks a little bit to the culture we've developed here. But it's athletes who said, hey, like, you know, it doesn't matter if Steve's there or, or, or Nate, our volunteer assistant or anybody else. Like, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what what is expected of me in these workouts and what I'm trying to accomplish because I've been in this program for, you know, either six months to four years. And, like, let's go execute it. I don't need my hand held to get this done. And right. I, it was it was amazing to watch. And it was even more interesting on a couple occasions because on several instances, I didn't write the exact details of the workout in terms of like paces and recovery and stuff, because I wanted to explain that when we had practice, but since <laughs> we didn't have practice, couldn't do that, but they were totally fine. They yeah. figured they it took, out. They took initiative. Yeah. Yes. They took initiative, they which like, is okay, amazing. This, yeah. It's like, Hey, these are the repeats we're going to do. Here's about what shape I'm probably in. Here's what we've done based on uh, in the past. Like, this is probably what I need to do. And they came and you know, they were right on my expectations right about, you know? And I think that like giving athletes initiative, like the ability to take initiative and the ability to make decisions is going to help them develop into winning athletes over time. Well, that's teaching. That's what teaching is. Teaching is saying, here is the knowledge. Here's how to apply it. Now go apply it without me there to hold your hand. The teachable moment right happens after the actions have been made it's not during the race you can't teach during a race you know you can have teachable moments in practice but the athlete has to run a rep and then you gotta you know uh debrief and discuss run a rep debrief and discuss you can you can have a lot of teachable moments after a race as well but it's not during you can't teach during because you we know we can't multitask that well as human beings and i would not ask an athlete to be in the um thorns of competition and with an eye about managing all the um you know inputs and um activities going on around and making all these decisions about this and that and plus all the physiological responses and then listen to what i have to say and interpret that (laughs) that's a hefty order but good teaching in my opinion or good coaching is coaching to autonomy coaching to independence i can make an independent thought an independent choice and say i'm going to do it like this and sometimes I think we forget that it's just running, right? It's, it's not this big a deal. It, the bigger deal is exactly that, developing young men and women to make decisions on their own and then accept 100% responsibility. Now, I'm a nice coach, and I have my coaching for and bargain, which is like when the athlete succeeds, it's all them, and when they fail, they can blame me all they want. But the reality is it's always all of them. Win or, win or loss, you know, failure or success. I'm just there to help interpret and guide and continue to help them grow and, and develop from the failures rather than get caught up in the superficiality of their ego being, you know, bruised a little bit because they didn't, you know, place or as high as they want or as fast as they want and then lose that teachable moment. And that to me, you know, winning it's it's difficult because it was like Stephen, I can't just say here's the prescription to win the 800, the 1500, the 5k, and the 10k guaranteed every time, no matter what, because it's been shown and proven that all different types of athletes with all different types of training plans and mindset have done that over and over and over again. But the thing that they share is in the defining moment of the race, whatever that may be. Sometimes it's 200 go, sometimes it's 400 go, sometimes it's a mile out. When that defining moment hits, they're excited. They're ready. They're the aggressor. They're on offense. They say, give me the ball. I want the shot with, you know, one second, double overtime. I like double overtime. Give me the ball. Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Larry Bird, some of the greatest NBA basketball players of all time, took the last shot. They didn't make everyone, but they took it. Some people take the shot, miss, and say, oh, I should never take the last shot ever again because the one time I did, I missed, I'm no good. So, And that, to me, is just heartbreaking. So I think this is, a, since we're near an hour, this is, this is a good place to end because I think that that 
that idea um, has to be translated over to track. And I'm, it, <coughs> it resonates with me. Sorry about all the coughing. I cracked my ribs, so I'm dying. Yes, over he's here. a warrior. Talk about <laughs> <Yeah>. showing up. <laughs> That's right. I'm showing Keep up to win. Crack rib. rib. Like, so, man, give the people what they want. That's Big right. Ball. We're dedicated, and we're all in on this thing. So, you, you know, uh, <laughs> not terribly long ago after our season when our athletes are on a break, right, we played a game of football, okay, two-hand touch football with, with our athletes, you know, and you're worried about, like, okay, injury risk, all that stuff, but we were just having good fun and competing. And it was so mm -hmm. fascinating to see, um, see the level of competition between people. And I kid you not, the last play of the game, it was fourth and down, fourth down, and like if this one team scored, game was over, et cetera, et cetera. And seeing you know one athlete go up and say, "Hey, like, just throw the ball my way in the end zone, and I'm gonna get it," <laughs> you know. And awesome. what happens? Like it happens. Like that that goes off. It 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 works, right? And the team wins the game. And, you know, I went over and talked to him afterwards and it was, it was kind of like, Hey, like that same attitude you took to trying to win this game that has to apply to racing, right? Yeah. Regardless of the scenario, <laughs> like, Hey, like, give me the ball. What, what does that mean on a racing standpoint? Put, I'm going to, I'm if you're counting on me, I'm going to put, I'm going to be in a place to win. You know, I've, I had one athlete, um, a couple years ago. It was the 800 runner who never ran the 4x4, and I've told this story a lot. Apologies if you've heard it. It's a great story. Yeah. It's worth a retell, and you get better every time. Yeah, it is. But, like, <laughs> so there we are, standing at the conference meet in a three-way tie. Comes down to the 4x4. Three teams in the, in the fast section indoors, right? And it's the three teams in the tie. We're sitting there. It's Carl Lewis as a coach for us. It's Leroy Burrell. World class sprinting sprinters, great coaches in their own right, and they're debating on who, who to put on the team and then who to anchor. And all the sprinters, all the 400 runners, are like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll run it, but I don't want to anchor." And my 800 guy who just won the 800, right, conference champion in the 800, but had not run on the 4x4 all season or ever for us actually, and he was a junior, mm. walks up to Carl Lewis. And Leroy Burrell and says, I'll race and I got the anchor. Love it. And you know what? He comes out and he wins it, right? You can watch. Maybe I'll link to the video so you guys can see it. But got overtaken early in the first 100 because, hey, he's an 800 guy. And he was racing some really fast guys, one of which who, who has run 999 in the 100. And... But stays calm, cool, collected, comes back over the last hundred and wins the whole team a, a conference championship. And right. That, and, and did he know that he was going to win? No. But he oh. had the gumption. He had the he had exactly. he said, I'm gonna pick myself. And and that's, if it comes down to it, I pick me. And that's the thing. It's like that's why I love relays and love, you know, the people who take the gumption and say, Hey, I'm I'm a gamer. And I'm going to get it, right? When I was racing, almost all my best times came from relay races. Why? Almost all my breakthroughs did. Because I knew I had a couple other guys who I had to have, you know, back up. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do everything for these guys. And I'm like, let's see if we can do it. And I think <laughs> even in an individual sense, like, it's not about saying like, hey, I'm going to go win this thing. Our 400, like Drayvon, never said, hey, I'm going to go win this thing. He said, I want it on me, right? I want to I wanna be the one who's active in this role here. I want to take this. Right. And yeah, if, he said, what you can expect of me is when I get the baton, I'm going to give it everything I got. Exactly. And then you can keep your head up high. But, it, <laughs> but you, you know, the spare guys who are cowering, at that opportunity and saw it as only, well, you know, they started doing this calculus, this and that, and I, oh, I don't know if I can save face, my ego's at play, and people, you know, think of me like, that's junk. Like, that's what you want. When you get to the line, and when the defining moment, you know, presents itself in the race, and there may be many defining moments, maybe three or four, right, where all oh, the packs, 
you know, stringing out, do I stay comfortable and stay at the, in this pack or do I jump and leapfrog and go with this break here? Uh oh, this person's doing a surge. Do I stay or do I go? You have to say, I'm going to give it everything I got. And that's what you can expect of me. And that's what you can expect of winners because they do over and over and over and over again. And it's such a habit. It's familiar. And actually not doing so is unfamiliar. And we know that unfamiliar things we're afraid of. Familiar things are we're comfortable, we look forward to, we know what we're getting ourselves into. So once you break the habit of, you know, um, not putting yourself in a winning position and that does become your now new habit, you stop, you won't backslide. I guarantee it. I've seen it with so many people who have developed the skill, developed the mindset, developed the attitude and the swagger that a winner has. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better. It's, you know, the habit of giving everything you got. That's winning, right? You do that, you're going to be on in a, in a good space. So hopefully you guys took away something from that and learned a couple of things that John and I have noticed over watching people who you know, become winners, become champions, et cetera, et cetera, over the years. And again, um, thanks for listening. Check out highperformancewest.com. We will have more and more exciting stuff as we roll out and expand and put up all sorts of goodies. And as I said, really check out being a part of the <coughs> scholar or athlete program there because, you know, we got a lot of cool stuff coming. So, um, you know. Yeah, Steve and I are excited. We're like like two, you know, high school girls like passing notes or I guess, you know, what? So what was the thing? Snapchatting now back and forth about like just saying text. Oh, I got this idea. I got this idea. Oh, man. Oh, I can't wait to share this. I can't wait to share that because the concept is we want to make it really accessible to become a better coach. And Steve and I had to do a lot of curating, a lot of digging, a lot of buy this book, go find this book. Someone said to get you know, this pamphlet or booklet at a conference. And I just want to make it easier. You know, it's coaching is yep. hard and, but becoming a better coach should be easier and more readily accessible. And that's what we want to do because the work we do as coaches, it matters. We shape hearts and minds. We change trajectories of life. The pay is not glamorous. The hours are not short. They're long and the price our families pay is dear every season. But if we can get better and we can encourage that empowerment, you know, everyone's benefits from it. And that is what highperformancewest.com or just the new High Performance West or, you know, really just what Steve and I are all about. Yep, exactly. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, keep tuning in.